All right, well, thank you so much for inviting me to be on this program. Uh, I'm excited to be a participant. I think it's great for our South Florida community um, and the people who love the art to be able to see it and for the artists to actually get to know each other. I know I have been enriched by seeing some of my colleagues who I was unaware of by watching this program. And uh, like I said, I'm excited to be a part and uh, eager to contribute my story. Well, thank you so much. Uh first time I officially met you was at the Selfish uh, opening. And uh, when I saw your work, I'm like, wow, I definitely got to get to know you, uh, get you on the show. But before we discuss the uh, Selfish uh, project, let's, uh, let's walk us back a little bit. I know you have a long, rich history. Uh, just w walk, walk us back uh, from early on, how you got into the arts. Sure, sure. Early on, um, my first introduction was through my grandparents. My grandfather, Apolonio Velasquez, he ran a nightclub in the 50s. And at that nightclub, it was just, it was either Black Axe with Motown or it was the Conjuntos, the Mexican music that were traveling around. And they would also have uh, like different theater groups, uh, Teatro Campesino, and also it would be like uh, Mexican wrestling matches would be there. And by the time I came around, uh, and, and mind you, just to back up a little bit, that's during the time of segregation. And they weren't really uh, able to have other groups uh, come through. And that just um, was later inspirational in my work. But at the time, by the time I came around, uh, that had been long closed. And the natatorium was no longer, but there was remnants of that history, whether it be uh, show flyers, bills, and stuff that were letterpressed, um, that had different printmaking elements to them, that were later, come to find out, little seedlings that kind of hatched out with me and became influential. Um, I wasn't aware of those really until later in my teen years when I would hear the stories and stuff. And then uh, as a teenager, I began playing music. Uh, we were growing up in uh, Southern California. I was raised in the San Fernando Valley, uh, Pacoima. Uh, big time influenced by uh, like Chicano art culture, the murals, the placasos, the tattoos, the lowrider culture, uh, graffiti writing, gang culture. A lot of that had a lot of my early graphic influence. Uh, but at that time, again, I was more interested in music at the time. And my father and I, we ended up moving from L.A. to Austin, Texas uh, area in central Texas. And that's where I finished high school. And it was during my high school years that I really got into playing music and playing the guitar. And um, then we started, you know, playing in bands. And I started making band posters. And making the band posters is what really introduced me back into printmaking or the process of it. And I started to really have a lot more fun in making the posters and the T-shirts and, you know, the merch for the band than I actually did actually playing in the band. I mean, I was okay, but my skills visually were really passing and surpassing my musical skills. And so, you know, it wasn't long before I just went ahead and forego totally on uh, music and went straight for the visual arts. Um, when I enrolled in college at the University of Mary Hardin Baylor, I was a, uh, was more of a writer I wanted to in the band stuff I was like making the music but I really liked the lyrics and I loved this idea of telling a story and the Chicano story we have a type of music called a corrido which is a song about a culture clash and that's what a lot of my music was about that I was writing and the poetry I was writing and so I wanted to go to school for creative writing and I would make these stories these narratives but then I would draw these pictures to go along with it and my English professors go hey Joseph um, you might want to consider taking one of your art classes here um, because your pictures are a little bit better than your stories. And so I was like, okay. So I go to take a fine art class in printmaking and I walk in and there's this dude that just, he looks just like me. We have the same Buddy Holly glasses on. We had the high and tight haircut, part to the side. He looks like he could be my dad. I walk in and he's pulling a block. Uh, he's pulling a print off a block. And I'm amazed. And I said, whoa, what is that? And he was like, this is a woodblock uh, print. And here, you can have it. And I was like, whoa, I can have this? And he said, yeah, here, watch. I'm going to make another one. And he just started rolling up. And, and I was so inspired at that moment. And I was so hooked. And I love the idea of how demystifying he was about the process with the print 
and how engaged I was because of his generosity. And that type of accessibility to have the fine art and it didn't make it precious and the value, it made it precious to its value to me. And uh, that's something that really captivated me about printmaking. And man, I just got so into that. Not so much uh, just about making the work, yeah, but it's what you do with the work after you've made it. And that was the thing that really captivated me about printmaking because, you know, I started taking the art classes. Yeah, I'd paint and I'd make sculptures or whatever. None of the stuff really captivated me much like the way printmaking did because of what I could do with the, with the prints. You know, I can spend 30, 40 hours carving on a wood block and I could literally pull hundreds of prints from them. Where I spend that much time on a painting, that painting is just for one person. And I felt that printmaking can afford me a larger audience where I wanted to share uh, my work and I could also make it accessible. You know, because many people in my family and the way that I grew up, man, we didn't have fine art in our home. A matter of fact, I think we might have had some impressionist uh, posters that they pick up at Hobby Lobby because they were on sale. You know, like everyone got night cafe in their kitchen or starry night on their way to the bathroom or whatever. Maybe some Monet flowers while you're in the bathroom or something. They'd be that kind of stuff that we would have. And but as close as we got to fine art, you know, my dad be like, we ain't spending two hundred dollars on a painting, you know. And so that was like the side of the tracks that I grew up on. And so making prints and being able to just give it to those family members and being like, hey, take down that Monet and put this up, you know, instead. And it invited, I felt, a whole new audience to come in in a more democratic nature and a kind of way of welcoming of those. And I felt printmaking was that way. So after undergrad, I applied to graduate school, at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and um, I was lucky enough and fortunate enough amongst the schools that I applied to that Madison uh, offered me a free ride. And I was like, hell yeah, I'm going to go. And I was really captivated about getting away from home. You know, I'd been in the South and the Southwest my entire life, and I really wanted to kind of broaden my horizons and change uh, my audience demographically. And, you know, I found that, you know, yes, Wisconsin was snowy, it was cold. And, you know, I seen snow in a Thomas Kincaid painting, but I had never really been through it in real life. I didn't know about the layering. I didn't know you had to wear chapstick, or if you smile too hard, you're gonna crack your lip or the pain you feel when you fall on the ice. Um, but it was a culture class for me because you know I found out that the snow wasn't the only cold white thing in Wisconsin. There wasn't a lot of people that looked like me at that time. There were other Chicanos and, uh, that I went to school with. And so that kind of change was really instrumental in my work and my narratives and how I work because you know when I make work and or show my work in LA or even here in South Florida or in Texas, this is a, you know, a very uh, Latin community. They're open to a lot of this. A lot of it is an alien to what I'm doing. It doesn't seem like it's exclusive. Uh, but when I put myself in a whole different region than like Wisconsin, people didn't know like, yo, why are you doing these skulls? Why are you doing this? What's this mean? And it, it challenged me to build up my narratives and do things in a different way that would make it more uh, inclusive and not exclusive to a certain community. And so I really enjoyed that opportunity that I got. And yeah, that's after that, I started a, a kind of a, an art idea that turned into a business. And what that art idea was was for my thesis. My colleague and I, Greg Nanny, we discussed about these whole things that I was talking about with the democratization of art. And we proposed a thesis project for our third year in graduate school where we proposed to our committee that we wanted to load up a press in the back of my truck, with the, had a camper, and we wanted to go around to different uh, at-risk youth centers, community art centers, uh, small schools, any place that did not have printmaking, and we wanted to take printmaking to them. We wanted to kind of recontextualize the printmaking experience of taking it out of a studio and go take it somewhere else where people wouldn't expect to engage. You know, for like myself, I didn't know what printmaking was until I went to school. And that's exactly what I found out in these communities when we started this. And my committee, to our surprise, they said, yeah. And uh, we began touring around in those 13 schools, but 13 became 30, 30 became 50. And then we satiated our needs for our thesis project. And then we had not only schools that didn't have printmaking programs, but some very top known schools with printmaking programs wanted us to come in and share our experience, share the prints that we had gathered with each stops, 
the different processes that we were learning along the way and you know to print with us and you know we did that for a number of years matter of fact we did that eight years we visited over 230 college campuses across the country and we traveled over 220,000 miles me and this dude greg side by side uh, we don't drive anywhere together now um, because you can't drive that far with anybody no more and like be cool now he's like my brother we've been through all this and that was kind of our educational part and then we got proposed by a couple of uh, big industries because they would we go to college campus and we would pull out the press. We'd have our wood blocks and we were printing them on T-shirts for college kids and we would charge them five dollars a print. So they'd roll up to the dorm. They'd get their shirt with a spaghetti stain on it. I would print a wood block on it. Boom. That would become their favorite T-shirt again. And that started to be something we had to create this ink mix. Uh, to make that work. And we started doing really well with that. And we would have a line of 50, 60 college students wanting to do this. Little by little, yes, we started raising our rates too. Um, but some uh, that caught the attention of these marketing reps. And they said, hey, can you do these for these indie rock bands and go on tour for this company? And we were like, what company? It was like, well, it's for RJ Reynolds. And we were like, cigarettes? Nah. And then they gave us a paper that said, but we'll pay you this much and you get insurance. And at that time, we had just got our master's degrees. We were done in grad school. Greg and I looked at each other and be like, can we do it over the summer? And they said, yeah. And so what that afforded us is a new opportunity to continue what we were doing with our educational outreach. Uh, but then it gave us a summer to tour with these indie rock bands. And so that was really crazy because we, would, uh, we were touring with uh, this band called Spoon the most. Uh, and with Spoon, we traveled like, it was like 50 different ex uh, shows that we did with them all over. And it was really crazy because the people who we were bringing this to had never seen this before. And we had the roadies would carry our press. We had like a 1,200 pound press, 1,200 pounds. And they'd be lifting it up like it was the Ark of the Covenant, man. Those dudes hated us. And they would lug it in and we would set it up and we'd have these hipsters. We'd be in Brooklyn and we'd be printing and we'd have these, you know, hipsters come up and be like, did you guys create this? He'd be like, man, this process is 550 years old, man. This is not, no, we did not. But, you know, let me give you the history of it while I'm printing your shirt. And they were a captive and receptive audience. And it made their merch sales just boom, went off the charts. The marketing people loved it because it gave them an experience. And man, and nobody's going to wear a T-shirt with like, you know, a cigarette logo. But if it's real small on the sleeve and you got this big old wood block, or if it's inside the tag, even better. Kids are like, yeah, OK, I'll wear that. And so it was really a great experience for us in that uh, it was exposing what we wanted to do with our outreach uh, to a whole new audience. We did that for a number of years to even set up uh, a brick and mortar later in Brooklyn. And we were doing stuff for Jack Threads, Newberry Comics. Then we started making work, uh, working with the New York Islanders where we took our press into the Barclays Center and we were printing uh, for the NHL. Uh, wood blocks on t-shirts with all these drunk hockey fans and we were doing stuff like that and uh, again a whole new audience a whole new level and so we started increasing our marketing and so the more and more we started doing these marketing events the less and less schools we started doing and we started doing stuff with the NBA Toyota all these different stuff and my heart really wasn't in it I love carving I love printing I love taking to the people but we weren't hitting the schools like we used to and it's at that time uh, and that was about maybe eight years ago. And I told my buddy Greg, I said, hey, man, I th I'm thinking about entering academia. I'm going to apply for a job in South Florida. And we said, all right. And so uh, I got the job. I got here. And when I got here at FAU in Boca, I was still making images and designs for stuff that we were going to be doing for like Duval Belgian Nail or Oma Gang or any of the stuff that Greg was doing up in Brooklyn. Um, and I think just like what, two years after I got here, when we were in the middle of that, that's when the pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hit, that's whenever we closed shop in Brooklyn and uh, Greg moved back to Nashville and we kind of closed the doors on that process. And I just really, at that point, just really began to focus a lot more on my teaching and my own work uh, where I was really giving it in because I had this chunk of time that I was doing for our, our business, Drive By Press. And now I was doing it more for Joseph. And so uh, in the last couple of years since the, in the pandemic, I've really put, you know, my foot on the clutch and put it into the next gear and started making more of my own work to be, you know, super, super focused 
on building up my narratives and changing up and responding to a lot that I saw on the road because that's really one of the things that I never felt that I had an opportunity to do with all the travels is really say like time out and work in the studio uh, because when you're on the road as much as we were our studio was the hotel room and so being able to have an actual studio like this and being able to come in it's just like I just love to just like boom and just spread ink everywhere and go really crazy in here and it's been really fun to be able to share these experiences with my students now as an educator and now to doing stuff in the community as well and uh, being in part with the stuff there with the selfish at uh, Boynton uh, for the city of Boynton Beach and the upcoming uh, exhibition that I'll be curating there in the fall. Wow. This is one of the main reasons why I love this project. It's these stories. You know, I get to sit here and listen to you and I am, I'm always amazed at these stories because they were so powerful. And uh, I truly hope the viewers that's going to be watching this will feel the same way, you know, uh, I, I felt his uh, sitting with you. All right. Well, this is a process that's been going on since the 14th century. Like the first use of the wood blocks, uh, it actually comes from the furniture guild. Because the furniture guild, you, uh, the same tools and the gouges that were used um, for furniture were used for making the first relief blocks that were used for playing cards, religious iconography, um, and other like infographics. That's kind of like the birth of it all. Um, the tools have different heads. They have different rounds, or the gouges as they're called. Uh, one has like a little fine line for a V, the other one has a big U, and the other one has a smaller U. And it begins with the drawing on a block of wood. You make the drawing and where it's black, you want to carve everywhere the negative space. And you have to do it in its reverse. And what I love about woodcut is that there is no backspace. There is no control Z. Once you carve something, it's gone. And if you make a mistake, you have to find a way to kind of incorporate that mistake into your composition. And I love that for, it's like a metaphor for life for me is that, you know, you can't control Z mistakes that you make. You kind of just got to like work your way into it and try to make that negative a positive. Maybe doing another negative. No, that doesn't work. So after you have the drawing, you simply have the tool and you really want to just kind of carve away and you can see like the wood chips. Now this particular substrate I'm carving is called MDF, but you can really use any type of wood. In traditional Japanese woodcut, they'll use the harder woods like cherry, um, but they're hand printing. They're not running through a press. And since we're running through a press, we can just be using this kind of wood because the MDF and it carves fast. That's what I love about it. And you have to have sharp tools. If your tools are dull, then you're gonna have a lot of resistance and you're gonna have a lot what's called rocking where you're trying to push it and it makes the lines wavy. If your tool is sharp, you can make a nice clean line. So this is Vlad the inhaler. So as you're doing this, since you've been doing this for so long, you kind of know when to use a much finer uh, point compared to when to go to a much wider point. Exactly. You also know, and if you'll see, that I'm carving in one direction. Uh, if I need to go like a curve on this hair, as you see, what I often do is I turn the block. So you see there, like if I'm going there, I'll turn the block, not my elbow. When you're carving like this, you'll get fatigue, you'll miscut, um, you'll lose articulation of what you're doing. And so you kind of want to have it uh, on a swivel so then you can either move your body or move the block, but not so much your arm where you lose control. And it's a thing over time. I'll get it with a lot of students uh, or maybe I'm teaching a workshop. They'll say, oh, but you make it look so easy and so fast. And I let them try it and it just kind of goes everywhere. But then I remind them that, I mean, I've been doing this, you know, I've made over 10,000 hours worth of cuts. 
and you know you do something for that long then you you definitely develop a, a, a strength and a speed uh, for that type of carving and then you also have what I love about it is it's very meditative for me like when I'm carving I'm not thinking about the news I'm not thinking about politics I'm not thinking about reports that I have to write for work maybe that's a bad thing but maybe my boss ain't listening uh, but I'm just focused on the task at hand. So it's a really beautiful thing that it, it'll keep you in the moment. And that's what I love about carving is because when I'm carving, I can honestly say that there's not a lot in my world that exists beyond my task at hand. My focus is right here in it. Even though I'm talking, uh, I'm thinking about what I'm trying to highlight in particular areas or how I'm trying to go through it. and. Then after a while, you just really get in the zone and you just really, really get into it, into the carving. And that's something that's always captivated me about this process. And you have to be careful because if you miss cut, like I said, it's gone. So I'm spreading the ink right now. And this is traditional oil-based ink. And like I was saying, we were printing on t-shirts for these indie rock bands on these tours or on college campuses when we were going. And the ink that we were using, we had to modify. And so we had to add a few things to do that. And like I said, we had been doing it for so many years and having these different results that it caught the attention of some ink manufacturers. And one in particular was Gamelin Artist Colors. And they contacted us and said, hey, we heard a lot of requests and we were wondering if we uh, can invite you out to take your mix. Short story long. This is our mix uh, in the world's tiniest font. My name's there, <laughs> but this is our mix. So we get like a certain uh, annual cut of the ink and um, this is something that's provided at art stores all across the country now. And it's been really nice to have that part of the legacy of what we've done and to even share that experience with my students. So I laid out the ink and you see then I'm just rolling it up and I'll change the roller and I want that kind of like a nice, smooth, almost like a football texture there. And then I'll go to ink the, the block. And when inking the block, inking the block is, is kind of a mechanical process. You know, the artistic expression is the carving. Uh, this part is kind of like painting a wall. The first thing you do is when I start from left over the block, notice that I don't go all the way over and I'm slowly kind of working my way over the block. And then I'm gonna come back this way and I'm picking up the edges that I didn't get the other hand. And now I'm gonna go diagonally over the edge. Kind of like in the shape or the pattern of the Union Jack, you know, the British flag. And so that, doing it in that manner that really ensures that that first charge of ink that I put on is spread evenly across the entire block. And then you typically want to do two charges. Every time I put ink on here like this, this is called a charge. And so I'll charge the ink. I'll make sure that I roll it. So I spread the ink evenly. And then I'm going back to do a pass. So every time I roll ink on the block here, it's a pass. And people often ask, well, how do you know when it's ready? And I was like, it's the sound, it's the feel, and it's the glare of the light when it hits the block. It'll reveal where it needs more ink. And so when you're doing this, you're listening. And you want it to have the similar sound that it has when you put the roller in the palette, as you can hear that here. And that's the same sound here. I love that sound. I love the smell. When we're on the road, man, our car smelled like this like the whole time. All right, so this is just about done. I'm going to do one more diagonal on each way. So I have a shirt down. The shirt is up. I have a blanket on the bottom. Typically with printmaking, you have a blanket on top, but I have a blanket on bottom for this. And now I'm going to spray it with a little bit of water. And the water uh, allows the cotton T-shirt to kind of absorb it and kind of comes together a little bit more. It gives me a more solid printing surface. And so then we have the block. We're going to put the block over. You see in the back of the block, I have a line through it. 
and that shows me where I want my alignment. And we put it about three fingers down below the collar of the shirt, just like so. And then I'm now going to run it through the press. and tight. Is there a time frame yet to leave it under the uh, press for? No, once the pressure's set, you can go back and forth, do it hundreds of times, really fast. Are you ready? One, two, three. So we would do this at rock concerts or at, you know, schools, but we would do this two, three hundred times a night. And so it's just like rowing a boat. So what we would do next is the ink with the dryer that we have in it, it's going to take about 24 to 48 hours to dry. Probably 24, but we would tell people 48. And because the ink is still wet, we put a piece of newsprint over it, like so, and then we fold the t-shirt over the newsprint because people are at a concert man they can't have a wet t-shirt you know and uh, what we would do is fold it just like so and we have these special bags printed up and we would have special tape that said do not open with and it had the date printed on it and we would seal it up like this and give it to the person tell them to wash cold and enjoy So one of the things that we were doing while we were on the road uh, with Drive-By Press doing these printmaking tours is we would do steamroller uh, projects and uh, we would go to a school and maybe we'd be there for a week and we would carve with the students and give them carving workshops and we would take large scale work and large blocks and rather than running through the press, we would actually rent out from the heavy equipment rentals uh, what's called a gravel compactor. Uh, which the other name people know it is a steamroller. And we've all seen them on the street when they're that big, big drum and it's rolling over the asphalt for the street. Well, we saw that and said, you know what? That's a big old press. We can run over stuff with that. And so we began carving giant blocks of wood, putting bed sheets over it using our ink and then printing them up. And that's how I got this giant piece. And it's something that I wanted to do. And like, you know, there's not a lot of print studios. There's very few. Uh, that have like a four foot or five foot by 10 um, printing base where you can print this large. Uh, but a steamroller uh, gravel impactor, it's only a few hundred bucks to rent over a weekend. Um, and so that's really where I wanted to go and make large scale woodcuts. That was like one of my ambitions to do kind of jump, you know, printmaking is often limited to the size of your press or with what you're willing to print by hand. But printing on fabric by hand doesn't come out the same as it does with the pressure of the press or a steamroller. In this particular one, one of the things that I was doing was a suite of the Mexican wrestling masks. Uh, earlier, I spoke about my grandfather's nightclub uh, where they had performers and including some of the Lucha Libres, which is the free wrestlers that would come through wearing the masks. And uh, they would perform there and seeing the old posters and the playbills left over from that was really inspirational to me, but I also liked what the masks acted as a metaphor, where it's not who you are underneath, it's who you are when you're wearing the mask. And I thought that with the human condition that we all wear masks uh, at times. And I wanted to create a body of work that had inner narratives with the mask. So here I have the wrestler uh, and this particular piece is called The Road to Perdition. And I have him there with the weight of the world on his shoulders. And we have the distance of the horizon. We have the sounding of the crow and, you know, the praying hands and the church are on one side. He's got ambition and bravado on the other side and this dark road uh, ahead of him. And that was his challenge and his road to perdition, his road to forgiveness, his road to what happens next in his life. And I think this was a little bit about me, uh, about where I was headed and what was up for me with being on the road. We printed up on a bed sheet 
Then I uh, hand dyed the bed sheet uh, completely red. And after it was all red and black, then I went through with the mix of bleach and water and literally brushed the whites back, boom, 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 to make it pop back up. Then I added batting and sewed it and put grommets so that way this uh, could actually be exhibited. And so this is where I, I saw my work. I wanted to do a suite of this as soon as we got off of the road. So my current work involves making these boxes and mounting my prints and uh, onto the boxes that I've done over the years. And it's afforded me the opportunity to bring back some of the woodcuts that I made while on the road and finding the right place for them. And that the boxes on how they're arranged, how the narrative can change by the position. And the boxes kind of act like, you know, like the Russian dolls and the, the boxes will collapse inside of one another uh, for shipping. And so that makes it really cool. But each one of the boxes has a uh, different imagery that I've had um, and I've made uh, throughout my career. Uh, but again, I'm able to put these on here and all of a sudden they start changing the meaning on how uh, they are presented and how they are juxtapositioned. And so this is where I'm really captivated right now. I'm making object oriented printmaking and that the viewer isn't just seeing something that is matted or framed on a wall where this is an actual object that they're having to kind of circumnavigate. And as they go around, the narrative changes, the story changes. And I thought that that really relates to the world we live in today about the information uh, bubble that we live in where if you keep on getting it from the same source, if you keep on standing in the same place, you're gonna hear the same story. But if you change your sources and your positions around, the story and the narrative too will also change. The Batman symbol with the Chicano, uh, that's a very, uh, pop, it has a pop culture but timeless theme to it. And it's, it, it's, it's a very, ingenious uh, take on it. Would you share with us how did you come up with, uh, with combining uh, the, the Batman logo uh, with, the, with, with the Chicano? Well, that, the Chicano Batman, um, which there is now an indie rock band, I think they've been around for a while, but the term Chicano Batman has been in the Chicano vernacular for years. Um, you know, the first of all, like it goes back to who played the Joker. You know, and you have Cesar Romero played the Joker. And in our culture, that was the first time that we ever really saw a, another Latino that was in popular culture in that high regard. And, you know, we had Desi Arnaz as well. Uh, we had like, you know, Roberto Clemente, uh, but having Cesar Romero as the Joker, uh, that was something that uh, my grandfather was like all about. And we would just like, well, let me watch the Batman. And then, we would refer to my grandfather as Chicano Batman because he had a way of fixing things where, you know, there was a time when people go, oh, someone would MacGyver this and they would change that. But that's what my grandfather would do. He was always trying to outfit something to satiate a need that we couldn't afford to buy something new. Uh, he would just kind of, you know, retrofit it, which in our culture, there is this term called rasquache and or rasquachismo. And that's like, making do with what you've got, making the best of it, or like changing its use to satiate another need of it. And my grandfather would do this and we would call him Chicano Batman. And so when I made the Chicano Batman, that's what I'm referring to. I'm referring to that idea of Rasquache, the idea of making do with what you have uh, culturally. And that's my placement within having that. As also as well as kind of appropriating that image of the, uh, dot pattern of Elvis that I use there with the bandana, I'm showing like a re-appropriation uh, of what's happened a lot with Chicano culture, which has been taken with whether it be the style of clothes, the music, or the cars, like what we've had, how that gets taken from popular culture. And this is kind of like a re-bringing uh, that back uh, 
to the culture and my way of doing it. Um, so that's that's where I get the whole idea from the Chicano Batman. I have uh, another question for you. The corn, mm. the inside of the corn. Uh, I am, I'm intrigued, but I want to hear from you because I, I'm, I'm seeing different colors, and I want I want to know what do they represent? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and 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 why? And also the uh, how the background is a whole different uh, way. I'm curious about that too. Okay, well, I'll start at the background and I'll come forward. Is that the background in the use is a different color palette, but used of the traditional pattern of the sarape. And that is a, like the Mexican blanket that I have. And uh, I just kind of changed the colors of that so it really helps pop forward with the corn. Um, but my use of corn, uh, I use in this because corn is very, very important to us here in the Americas. It's something that is unique geographically to us here in the Americas. Uh, and there's something else that's beautiful about corn is that corn will not grow on its own. It has to be cultivated, just like our culture, just like our histories, just like our humanity as a society. We have to nurture it. We have to cultivate it. We have to teach others and we have to share it and we have to welcome the diversity that exists within corn is what we have with each other. And so corn is very symbolic to me for that. Um, of what it gives to life and how life needs to be bringing. And if you see in here, I have the angel that's carrying the corn, almost like the corn is the mother provider of the Virgin of Guadalupe, the Mother Mary, and holding it in that manner. And that's why I present it in uh, that way. And I'm really glad you asked about the corn uh, because I really think that that's, you know, what I stated about that cultivation um, that's how I feel about this program, that it's allowing for that type of cultivation and representing the society and the culture of the arts being made here in South Florida. And so I have a gift for you, and this is a print, and this is an etching that I've made uh, with the corn, and it's titled Cultivation, and it's a thanks that I want to give to you as well. So this print is for you, Ethic. You know, <laughs> All your work is phenomenal. You know, the first time I met you, I am a fan. But seeing the corn, it it just stood, it stood so tall to me. And I had to ask you the meaning. And now that you, now you explain it to me, it is a very powerful piece. Yeah, that is one of my latest pieces. This is like one of the last things that I've done. 